step up every time to this. Hopefully Pat's got us in good hands up there in the booth uh, today. Good afternoon. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the, the morning breakout sessions. Heard lots of great things. Before we get to the introduction of our keynote for today, I'd like to provide you with a few observations um, and recognize a few people before we get started. Today so far, 63 sessions were offered, including 10 two-hour sessions. We had 53 different staff members facilitating the sessions this morning. Only one was not part of our BHO Schools community. Woo! Yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty impressive. A few more numbers here. 37 different technologies were demonstrated or used as part of the, part of the session today. Approximately 70% of the sessions this year, instead of focusing on technology, were directly focused on instructional design and delivery choices. That's a big shift. 60% of the sessions did focus on developing some specific technology skills for teachers. A great thing as well. 80% of the sessions today, so far, were founded in the development of the four C's in students. And so in creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, or communication. Overall, that's pretty amazing. <coughs> BHM staff members created hands-on sessions, presentation sessions, roundtable and discussion sessions, and exploratory sessions that were hands-on. This year, there was an incredible focus on technology, or not on technology, but just on learning in general. I'd like to have you join me um, in giving our presenters a thank you and a round of applause for their contribution today. I'd also like to briefly recognize the great team who organized this day. There are a lot of people in the mix here to make this all happen. The planning team this year is made up of Mark Mischke, Gary Tice, Janina Rothstein, Joy Kiefer, Ryan McCallum, Jenny Weichel, Tess Tyker, Jack Brady, Pam Miller, and in addition to those folks, the technology support team, clerical staff, food service staff, custodial staff, and then the high school who's hosting us today. All of these people have put forth a great effort to make sure that you have a great day here at Teach 2.0. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for the day. Ryan McCallum has been teaching English and Journalism at Buffalo High School for the past 11 years. For the past three years, he's been working with, as a technology integration specialist across our district at all buildings. Ryan has a Bachelor of Arts from Concordia College in Moorhead and a Master of Arts in Teaching and Learning from St. Mary's University. He is a recipient of numerous awards, including he's a Ties Exceptional Educator for Technology Integration. He's the 2011 Minnesota Journalism Educator of the Year. <laughs> Nationally recognized advisor from the Dow Jones News Fund. He's a recipient of the 2011 Lars Stensler Intellectual Freedom Award. He's the advisor for the Hoofprint, which was recognized nationally with the Pacemaker Award. For those who don't know exactly what that is, that's like the Pulitzer Prize of high school journalism. Very impressive. He has addressed pre-service teachers at St. Cloud State and Concordia College in Moorhead, and will be presenting about video games and learning at ties this winter. In addition to receiving several awards and teaching in the K-12 environment, Ryan also serves as an instructor teaching graduate level classes to help teachers effectively integrate technology into instruction in K-12 education. All of this is great, but the coolest thing about Ryan is his absolute passion for learning paired with his sense of curiosity. His enthusiasm is contagious, as many of you have worked with him, and his ability to connect with adults and K-12 students is amazing. His heart is truly grounded in helping every individual learn and grow. A hacker at heart, Ryan has found ways to amplify his results and leverage tools available to him so he can accomplish his goals. He's willing to take risks, but creates environments where others feel comfortable taking risks as well. At times, this includes technology, but whatever he works on is continually grounded in helping create collaborative environments, teach and communicate effectively, critically examine ideas or concepts, 
and encourage the discovery and development of creativity in people. Today, Ryan is going to speak about learning and the role technology can play to help us get the results we desire. It will challenge us all to reflect on our own practice and stretch our ideas using what we already have. With that, please welcome, join me in welcoming Ryan McCallum. So little known fact that I was in the uh, very first production to use the PAC in this building, I was Lieutenant Brannigan in Guys and Dolls, the, uh, the only non-singing, uh, non-dancing role. Uh, and I was just as nervous back then as I am right now. Um, so thank you for, for uh, putting up with me right now. Um, welcome. Uh, but Josh didn't tell you that, that introduction because I wasn't the first choice for a keynote. Actually, he explored some much bigger names. The first one that he explored was Ken Robinson, uh, who is a, a huge name in education. Uh, but he was going to charge $30,000, and I had $30,000 to give a keynote address. Yeah, and that doesn't include travel or hotels or anything like that. So $30,000 was a little bit out of our league. I think just by using this picture, I've got to pay him like $30 bucks um, um, to send that to him. But I'll kind of do my best, Ken Robinson. Children need to be more creative. All right, that's my favorite opportunity. Question. So, so uh, when they're looking for keynote speakers, uh, the search got a little more narrow and a little more narrow, and I kept suggesting people because I did not want to do it. Um, and then I one day, I think Mark Mishke was pointing across the table at me, and I made the mistake of reading a book uh, that had a cartoon in it that reminded me that I had everything that I needed, and I hated it. I had an idea for a session, I had all the tools I needed, I had experience working with you guys, and I hated the fact that I had everything I needed. Having what you need sometimes is a horrible feeling. Um, <laughs> but at that moment, I had what I needed, so I said that I would do it. I did some research on why speeches are so terrifying, and here's one thing that I figured out. Uh, we come from a system that really rewards fitting in, and I think that's even biological. If we had ancestors that didn't like fitting into a pack of people, they probably got eaten. So we don't have that gene that lets us like stand out. I've got a line right here that I'm not supposed to cross because the video camera won't get me. So I'm standing outside that line right now. I feel like a goldfish, like I'll be as big as the tank um, if you let me have it. Um, so we have a society where, where we, we reward people for fitting in. And people who have learned to stand outside the lines, well, something terrible happens to them. <laughs> I'll let your imagination spill in the rest of it. Uh, <laughs> but in the animal kingdom, standing out is not a very good thing. Our system kind of rewards it. But we still have lines. We're far away from that, that lifestyle, but there's still lines. Some of the lines come from within us that scare us from keeping to, to stand out. Some lines are external. They could be other people. They could be fears of failure. They could be limitations that people have. But those lines still exist that keep us from standing out. And the system that we have right now really does reward it. Things like No Child Left Behind aren't everyone's favorite thing, and they kind of make the emphasis on being average. That system has worked for most of us. We like teaching. We like school. And it worked for us. But I don't think you would have the same ambitions for yourself as you would for this group. The class of 2025 is already in our buildings. They're getting off buses every day, coming to us, and you know what they think? They think we know what we're doing. <laughs> When I get to class of 2025, my son is in the class of 2025. He doesn't know, we have no idea what the world's going to be like when he's out of here uh, in 13 years. Here's what the world was like for me when I was five. <laughs> if someone asked me what I wanted to do when I grew up, I would be like a lion-human hybrid. And if I could do that still, I would do it. So, this is the Thundercats. And if it wasn't the Thundercats, it was He-Man, my like Saturday morning cartoon. I would be that guy if I could, I'm still working on it. <laughs> His entertainment is so drastically different than mine, and I'm starting to wonder what implications that entertainment has. Just look at what he watches. Musicians skating on treadmills. 
People, scientists doing us, uh, experiments with Diet Coke and Mentos. People doing impossible tricks on impossibly expensive bikes in impossible locations with impossibly good cinematography. My own students making videos and putting them out. These guys are like these heroes. And we live in this world where even getting dressed has to be cool. And sitting in chairs is awesome. And that's my five-year-old's entertainment. So it wasn't much of a surprise when he had um, kindergarten homework about patterns and numbers and lengths of different objects that he asked if he could do his homework as a video. And I'll show you a little bit of it right here. If he directed it and told me where to stand and where to take pictures, uh, and he did everything else. stick out to us. When we hire people, we hire the people who are most remarkable. We take the blue person over the gray person any day of the week. One of my students was shocked as uh, she's really successful at school. She spent 12 years fitting in. She gets great grades. And her college applications ask her things like, how are you different from everyone else? Why do you deserve this scholarship? And she has no idea what to tell them. It's no secret right now that we live in a world where leadership is worth more than compliance. But the class of 2025 has to be a leader. Each person has to be able to lead. And that's, that's hard. We got a group of teachers together, a lot of them were in your presenters today, as well as first and second year teachers, and that's the main thing we talked about. What do we need to do to educate the class of 2025 and the seniors that we have in the class of 2012? Some of the things they said, uh, well, first of all, one of the best things about this is that the biggest word, the words used most often are students and kids. And the second biggest are thinking and create. We've got to make sure our kids are thinking differently and doing creative and creating things in our classroom all the time. This is the first generation that's going to be as smart as they are curious. Knowledge is free. Information is free. So it's our job as teachers to make our kids as curious as possible. Because they have access to knowledge that you and I could only have dreamed of just five, six years ago. We're as smart as we are curious. So from kindergarten to 12th grade, curiosity needs to be a priority for us. Here's what some of your peers said that we need to be doing. Our classrooms need to be safe and comfortable places to take risks and think at a higher level. We've got to keep those lions out of our classroom as much as we can. We've got to seek out more than one right answer. There's going to be new literacies that are hard to teach. How do we know when and where and if to use Wikipedia? How do we know which is the best way to demonstrate your learning? What's, which tool you should use? All those things are going to be difficult. We as teachers need to be different people and do things differently. We have to encourage patient problem solving in a world of now. How do we get these kids to be patient when they can go from uh, YouTube videos to learning in, in less than a second? Creativity, enthusiasm, and interest is an interesting one because you know what it also kind of looks like to an outside observer? It looks like chaos. If we have creativity and enthusiasm happening in our classroom, to an outside observer, that really might look like chaos. And we're going to have to be a little bit more comfortable with chaos. And that's hard. Our kids are going to have to collaborate because it's not just about what I know now. It's how I can leverage my resources. My resources are either standing right next to me or half the world away over Skype. They're going to challenge themselves and the status quo. And all of this stuff is scary. This is the word that got brought up more than any other word on that word. I had to take it out. <laughs> scary and uncomfortable. And I believe it. It is scary. And it's going to be scary for the kids who are comfortable with this. It's scary for us because we're very comfortable sometimes. And it is going to be uh, a scary thing. The good news is that 
Uh, I really believe this. One thing Ken Robinson can't do that I can is I can say we and mean it. And I know we have everything we need right now to meet the needs of all these 21st century learners in the class of 2025. We have everything we need to do this long list of things that just a few years ago was nearly impossible. Publishing 15 years ago was hard. It was really difficult. Publishing now is an afterthought. You publish, then you make changes. <laughs> we can do all these things. Some of us can do these things with tools that fit in our pockets that we seem like uh, right out of science fiction. So we're scared. And that's good. Every good thing that you've ever done probably was preceded by a period of fear. I went bungee jumping when I was 12 years old, when I was too stupid to know to be scared. But I can tell you that when I was looking down at that pad that said shut up and jump, as a 12 year old, with a bungee cord tied to my ankles, I was terrified. Everything that we do that's worthwhile is usually preceded by a feeling of fear. And that's a good thing. Having everything we need is scary, because it means we have to act. The good news is, if we can't fail at it, it's not worth doing. So we have to put ourselves in situations that involve fear. The more we put ourselves in those situations where we get used to it, and we can feel the fear, and get over it, the better we're going to be at it, for our students. Here's my son again. I talk about him a lot because he's my favorite 21st century learner. And then when my youngest gets in there, he'll be my favorite. Um, this was him after he fell off his bike for the first time. You can see the fear in his eyes and that expression of like confidence tempered with anxiety. He knew what he was doing wrong. He said, Dad, when you stop pushing, I have to pedal. <laughs> As a technology integrationist, I've heard you guys say stuff like that a lot. When you stop pushing, I've got to pedal. Um, and he fell over and fell over and fell over. Finally, I said, you know what? I'm going to give Coben, who's my youngest, the video camera, have him record you. He said, sure. So forgive the, the, the camera work with this next footage, but it's a three-year-old taking video. <laughs> so there he was, he got out of the bike and he didn't wipe out, and he said, Dad! I can do anything that I'm not scared of. He ran to the park to try the monkey bars and try to push himself on his way. He was so thrilled by overcoming that. You guys can do that too. Sometimes it takes the youngest learners to teach us what we should be doing and how we should be thinking. What's great about Buffalo and Amber Montrose schools, what I've learned from working with all of you, is the opposite of fear is love. And you guys love what you do. And you guys care about your students. And it's really phenomenal. It's different than other districts that I get to talk with. You guys care. People will do things they're scared of if they feel loved. If they feel like they're cared about, they're going to take those risks. If your classroom is a place of caring, they're going to take risks that they wouldn't take otherwise. And this place is great at it. If our staff meetings are places of caring, we're going to take more risks as teachers. We have the benefit of being really good excuses detectors. Our kids have tried them. The number one, there's a good article I just read that the number one excuse has gone from like the dog ate my homework to I emailed it to myself, but it must have got blocked by the filter. <laughs> and you've heard these excuses from your kids, but your kids also tell you excuses that you can see right through right away. If I hand out a, a writing assignment and the kid says, I can't do this, I'm not a writer. Do I accept that? No. Math teachers, if this kid says, I'm not good at math, sorry, I can't do it. You're not going to accept that. I don't have the time. You don't accept those excuses. I have to get better at holding myself to the same standards I hold my students. It's really easy to hold them to that no excuses standard, and really easy for me to start using excuses that I would never tolerate. So we've got to, not, we've got to get over that. I'm not a tech person. I'm not creative. We have to be. We have tools. We have access, like very few other districts have, and very few other people have. How do we use the tools that we have? All of you guys have a keyboard in your classroom that we take for granted. You have a keyboard that's connected to something like your smart board, or it's connected to a dot cam, uh, connected to Infinite Canvas, to GroupWise, and maybe even to PowerPoint. Sometimes we forget that our keyboard's also connected to some incredibly powerful tools. Tools of creation and collaboration and publication. 
that can get our kids learning right away. I'll show Flickr as just one example. I was looking up for excuses science, and I saw this sign and thought about Todd Whitaker right away. <laughs> Stop. There is no excuse for hitting this door. I bet there's been no door that's been punched more times than that door. I'd be punching it if I could. So there's a picture out there of that. And I wanted to see what the comments were for that. And this guy named Turtle 50 he says, I'm an admin for a group called Octagon Signs. We'd love to have this image. So there's a group out there, the Octagon Sign picture takers, putting Octagon Signs out there. And I look at Turtle 50's pictures, and here's a guy saying, hi, I'm an admin for a group called Van Derived Cars. We'd love to have one of your pictures in our group. And I thought, Van Derived Cars must be the bottom of the flicker barrel. So I look at the group. And there's 187 people that have posted over a thousand images of van-derived cars. <laughs> there's an embarrassing amount of information out there. That, we can start <laughs> that little journey demonstrates one key part of, of 21st century learning, and that's this hyperlink culture that we have. You guys experience that. When you guys sit down to start browsing the internet, you have no idea when or where you're going to stop. And that's different than our classrooms a lot of time, different from my classroom. I know when the kids are going to stop, and I know where they're going to stop. When these kids sit down to browse, they have no idea where it's going to take them. They can take them from excuses signs to van derived cars in three clicks. And they have no intention of going there. So we've got these tools that can bring in surprising information. Take a look at this. It takes like five minutes to scroll down this blog post I'm working on. These are all colleges and universities that put their stuff out for free, podcasts and entire curriculums. And then there's websites that show you how to do things like dance and cook and raise chickens and learn languages. They'll take you from knowing nothing to being able to speak a different language. All of this exists out here right now. I'm still scrolling through it. Free books, psychology, get better at creativity, TED Talks, they're all right there. We can consume that stuff right now. And as we get better at consuming, we gotta push ourselves one extra step. We have all the information in the world that we can pull to us, but we're not really doing justice to teaching until we have people pushing our information as well. Just saw this quote yesterday and I had to add it. Information is powerful, but it is how we use it that will define us. How can we use information to solve problems that teachers don't make? Real problems. Information is powerful, but it's how we use it in our classroom that defines. Here's a flip cam. Here's a flip cam right here. We've got three of them that we're going to give away today just because we have what we need. So we've got three of these that we're going to give away to people who have a good idea about how they want to use it. I'm going to show you how one little $60 flip cam can have a huge impact on a curriculum. It's a story from, uh, that comes from Sioux City, Iowa. There's a teacher named Miss Matwick. And she teaches in an elementary school where 90% of the kids are free reduced lunch, uh, where poverty is everywhere. And she was posting on a website called DonorsChoose.org, where you can actually choose uh, which products you want to donate money to. And someone on Facebook picked this one up, one of my friends, and said, this is really cool. And I thought it was cool, too. She needed like $25 more dollars to finish the project, so I gave her $25. And then she started emailing each of the donors, saying, here's what I'm doing with the flip cam. She took a no-technology classroom where kids are coming from poverty, and she took that flip cam, and the flip cam wasn't the center of the picture. The kids started doing stuff like storyboarding and scripting and science projects and animation. And they would take those projects and then make a weekly news broadcast. And look at all the cool stuff we can do in our classroom. And because they're going to be publishing that, the kids got up to the challenge. And they published that to a classroom across the country that they were like sister classrooms with. And they would exchange ideas and connect with the kids. So she took a $60 piece of technology and made huge impacts in the way her kids learn and also turned them from consumers of information to producers of information. We have connections to anything. There are two billion potential teachers out there. People who have connections to the internet. Some of these teachers want to teach us like how to open a banana the right way. You're going to try this the next time you have a banana, I guarantee you. Some of us want to uh, learn how to fold a shirt in two seconds. <laughs> but there are other people out there. You can 
looked that video up there in slow motion after that. Night. <laughs> there are other people out there that want to do things like teach us math. Teach us every level of math from elementary through college. This guy at Khan Academy, I believe he started it because his nephew was having a hard time in math, so he started making videos for him. And now look at this quote on the bottom. I know it's hard to read. With so little effort on my own part, I can empower an unlimited amount of people for all time. I can't imagine a better use of my time. His website now has 2,600 videos and lessons and practice assignments on every area of math instruction. He's a teacher that's just out there waiting to teach kids. If you haven't used Skype in a classroom, it's free. You should start using it right away. My students reminded me of that. One of my students just like a month ago said, Mr. McCallum, during work night for newspaper, we're going to chat with the best-selling author. I was like, how? Oh. She volunteered to meet with that group over Skype and spent an hour with them talking about writing. And then after that, the kids went home and they were so enthused, they said, why don't we get a new person every month to talk to us? And so this is Scott Winter. You probably don't know him, but he's like a journalistic icon for these kids. They love him. They emailed him back and they were so thrilled when he said he'd do this, when he spent an hour with them talking the craft of journalism and writing and how to get better stories. And his lessons have been in my curriculum now for the last week and two. And it's incredible. Next week, they're meeting the person who wrote the textbook and spending an hour with him. And every time we get a person, it gets easier to get the next person. Hey, we've had best-selling authors, world-famous journalism teachers, textbook writers. Would you like to be a part of this group, too? <laughs> They're going to say yes. And it's getting easier for these kids. And that just started because they wanted to, not because I wanted to. That's a quality connection. That's one of the defining characteristics of 21st education, century education. The quality of our connections. And we're not just connecting to people over Skype but connected to the content in the classrooms, the meaning of our lessons, other people in the same room, including you as a teacher, you're still very essential, and themselves. Those quality of connections is going to define their education. This is one of my students' photos. Her name is Maya. She's brilliant. I'm her teacher. I can take credit for this. I taught her to think, no, I did not. This is Flickr. Again, she posts her pictures, she gets feedback from random people. She has people on Flickr she's never met that have inspired her to be a better photographer. And I asked her, who's your favorite photography teacher? Flickr was the thing that taught her how to be a good photography teacher. Uh, uh, photographer. It's a brilliant picture. It's a, a guy spitting flames at the Renaissance Festival. And that's not her best picture. She's great. The urge to share is strong. So when you give your kids something worth sharing, they're going to put it out there. One of my students just published her first story on hoofprint.net. She goes home and publishes it on it. Look at the feedback she gets. Great photo. Great article. Great job, Molly. Proud mama. Great job, Molly. Very nice. How do I post mine? Another one of my students asked. <laughs> they want to share. They want to put their stuff out there. They're waiting for you to do some of this stuff because they like it. We have questions and we have challenges. Challenges like there are haves and there are have-nots. Do we let that stop us? How do we maximize the use of technology in our classroom? Those kind of questions are tough and they stop a lot of people. We have a challenge like this. We have to change the very way we learn in order to help other people learn better. And if your brain immediately goes to how instead of no, you're thinking like a 21st century learner. Because those challenges are the things that will define us. Challenges drive 21st century learning. Not challenges that come from textbooks, but challenges that come from the environment. So if you're thinking about how can we get better at getting kids access to computers, how can I use these tools to the best of my ability in my classroom, you're thinking like a 21st century learner right now, and you're in the right place to be. We have permission, believe it or not, to start doing great things. I used to be terrified of asking for permission, so I'm going to tell you right now, you have it. Because I know your principals and the district leaders, and I know parents in this district, they want you to be doing something tomorrow in your classroom on Monday. You have permission from 99% of people. This was a study done by uh, P21.org, the Project for 21st Century Learning. Uh, they did a survey. 99% of respondents said that children should be doing 21st century learning in their classrooms right now. But I know we're teachers. And I know if we get 99 positive comments from students and one negative one, that'll keep us up at night. I know that if we have 99 good days as a teacher and one horrible day, 
will wonder if we should even be teachers at all. How much power are we going to give the 1% of people who might call and ask you a question? Why is my kid doing this? When you have 99 other people saying, do this right now. It's important for my kids to start doing this. Most importantly, you have permission from your students. They're waiting in your classrooms for you to be remarkable. And you guys are remarkable. And they love those moments because they get to be remarkable too when you're at your best. You have permission from everyone that matters to start making a positive change in your classroom on Monday, to take what you've learned from all these wonderful people here today and apply it. The only person that you have a hard time getting permission from is yourself. And you'll hold out as long as you possibly can before you say, yes, it's okay to take a risk. It's okay to be that zebra that's away from the pack, that's outside the line, no lion's gonna come out and eat me. It's okay to fail. Do you give yourself permission to fail? And to be remarkable. You've got to give yourself permission. That's the last person that you're waiting for. Everyone else wants you to start doing this. The only real way to fail right now is to go back to your classroom on Monday and do nothing. Because when we have everything we need, there's an expectation to act. And by not acting, we're failing. This is an easy thing for me to tell my students. Give yourself permission to challenge assumptions, to look at the world with fresh eyes, to experiment, to fail, to plot your own course, and to test the limits of your abilities. But you have to give yourself permission to do that, and you have to show your students that that's what you're doing, too, because they're looking at you. Those kids getting off the bus I showed you earlier, remember, they think you know what you're doing. They trust you. If you're doing this, they're going to do it, too, automatically and immediately because they trust you, because you care about them. We have the best teachers to show us how to be 21st century learners. Some of them you met today. Laura Bart, are you in here? I got you in a picture on a slideshow, so how does it feel? Um, <laughs> But the, we have teachers in our own building. We have how many people? We had, we had 40 teachers teaching you guys today that are willing to share what they know. But even more importantly, we have people like this guy that can teach us. This guy is a first grader. And he, when I was taking pictures of that classroom, he was so proud to sit in that chair and say, will you please take my picture with my iPad? He was proud. He can teach us how to be 21st century learners ourselves. We have all these kids who want to teach us. And guess what? If we don't know the answer, it's probably someone in our classroom that does. So she gets so excited, she figured out that girl just did something she didn't know how to do, so now she's going on her own. We don't need to know how to do everything. Our kids teach us the things that we need to know how to do. I don't need to know how to do everything with uh, Tumblr or what is Picnic that one of my students gave a session for. I don't know how to do anything with Picnic. One of my students was given that presentation. She gave that because she uses it. She could teach me how to use it. We need to learn how to be excited to share. Never seen a staff meeting look like this. <laughs> To have that urge, like that kid's feeling right now, that you've been building so long to get your hand up there because you have to share something. And not only to be so excited about sharing, but to put yourself out there, even if your work might be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we need to be so comfortable with sharing in the environments that we're in, that we're comfortable putting that, holding that up high, even if our work doesn't add up, even if we need help. Because the best of us, will give an opportunity to show your work and to come up and prove that you know it. To prove that you're in a safe place, that you can do it. To put you up at the smart board and get your fingers on it so you can show the whole class, I know how to do it. The people who presented for you today got a chance to do something that's intimidating, but to show you guys that they know how to do it, to show that you can do it too. These are our first graders and second graders showing us that we should be having these same expressions on our face when we're doing technology in our classrooms. <laughs> that we can be collaborative even if we're reading a book. 
that sometimes the best technologies are glue and paintbrushes to get hands-on with things. That is not always an iPad or a smartphone or a smart board. Sometimes the best technology is a pen and a pencil and a paper. That getting hands-on with stuff is the way that we learn. You can't learn about technology, you have to learn with technology. That education isn't about the tools that we use. It's about the excitement that comes from learning something new and the joy that comes from figuring something out for the very first time. This was a great moment. Tanya, I'm sorry I'm using this picture, but it's a great moment that was happening in your classroom. She had just figured out this math concept for the very first time, and it was a great moment for this girl. You guys are still more important than any piece of technology that's in your classroom. And you won't ever be replaced by technology. We have third graders with blogs, third graders updating their own websites, and doing that because they want to, and they're excited about it. And they're coming up grades every year, third and fourth graders ready to go with blogging and making websites. We've got people showing us how to be excited about technology. sleep, 
pebbles start falling into the bucket. You're in the shower that morning, pebbles start falling into the bucket. You drive into work and the sand takes care of itself and you got it all figured out. If you've got the three big ideas in place today, you guys will automatically take care of the other details. But the worst mistake you can make now is not use five minutes to start that spark that turns up into a great idea in your classroom. You've got time right now to start something. And I'll conclude the keynotes in about five minutes. So take, your, uh, take um, five minutes, take something out, I want to bring up the lights for a little bit. Uh, talk with someone, take out a piece of paper or your laptop, and spend five minutes just planning the big ideas. Start something right now. Okay, time's up. Hopefully you guys started something. And if you chose not to start something today, just please don't be a lion on Monday when someone's trying something different in the classroom next to you. Uh, remember what it feels like. It's difficult to step up. Just a minute, Josh is going to give you guys some instructions on where you're going to go for the time to work. And basically you do have an hour um, to work with the people you want to work with and the people that you work with every day. Um, I want to say thank you for being a tremendous audience. Um, you guys are nice. You guys are not lions. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone else who taught today and learned today, uh, who came with uh, great attitudes about learning today before a break. I want to encourage you guys to start something and do something different in your classroom, even if it's small, on Monday, because we have everything we need to be remarkable. Thank you. I know Pam Robinson was disappointed, but as soon as we finally talked Ryan into this and got him over it, I tell you, never regret the decision, and we are so lucky to have him. Um, so, great job. Let's give him another round. Ryan said you have some time, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to head back to grade level and department teams. You guys have some great ideas that you've um, gotten started on right now. You're going to have an hour. We've left it very unstructured. Um, there's not going to be somebody facilitating. There's not going to be somebody telling you what you have to do. You guys have ideas, and we're going to give you time to do that. When you get back to your room, though, um, that you're assigned, you're going to find a piece of paper there that at least provides you a little guidance. It has some prompts to think about, some starting points. Um, and you can choose to work on your own with a colleague, with a group. You can decide how you want to break out to do that and to start that planning process and take in at that next step into some of that deeper water and try and see things. At the end of the day today, on our, um, our site for the day, which is teach two, teach two zero, teach20.bhmschools.org, um, there is a link there that says work grade level work department planning time. And attached to there, before you leave today, there's a short, and it's short, it's a short little form um, that what we'd like to do is have everybody take just three, four minutes before you leave at three o'clock today to let us know what you're thinking and what some of those ideas are. Um, there's also one other thing that Ryan talked about, and that's the little flip cameras. We have three of these, and we're looking for a great idea that's incredibly concise. Three sentences or less. Um, and it's going to be how you're going to how you're going to use this if you want one how you're going to use it to help students collaborate or communicate in your classroom and to engage them in learning so that's also linked off that page three sentences or less Pam has one more thing to add so if you put one in earlier we may have to have you go back and redo it and put your name in. So, with that, thank you for a great day. Have a good time at the, the grade level uh, planning time and go do something remarkable. Thanks.